Last week I did a playthrough of this amplifier for you in the style of one of my favorite YouTubers, but today I do want to take you through this amplifier a little bit more in depth. Now just what the heck is this thing after all? You don't see old PRS amps every day because, well, there weren't that many of them. Most people think that PRS only started making amps in the last 10 years or so, but actually they started out in the early 1990s. You see, Eric Pritchard, who now owns Pritchard Amplifiers, a boutique line of solid state amps, and are actually really, really cool amplifiers, want to get one of those one of these days, helped to design this for PRS. And he really wanted to make it sound like a tube amp. You see, in the late 1980s, most people thought that tubes were completely on their way out. This was before Mike Matthews and Sovtech and all the Chinese made uh, tubes that we have these days. Everybody thought that tubes were going to disappear forever and we better start making do with these solid state amplifiers. And Eric really wanted to make this thing sound normal, uh, what people would expect out of an amplifier, not the cold, old solid state sounds of the early 1970s. He wanted something that was organic and warm. He actually made something that I think is a really unique, interesting amplifier. He had been making CNC machines and other various things to help Paul Reed Smith with manufacturing the guitars, and then Paul Reed Smith wanted to start making amps and tapped his friend Eric Pritchard. He didn't really have any amp experience, I'm speaking about Eric here, but he was going to give it his all for PRS. He took the various amplifier designs that he was working on to various players like Al Di Miola, uh, to Carlos Santana, and got them to review the amplifiers for him. And they kept giving him advice like, it sounds too cold, it needs to sound warm, or it sounds like white wine, it needs to sound like red wine. And Eric, who is a scientist and an engineer at heart, was trying to take all of their musicianly terms and turn them into an amplifier. And it turned out to be this. This amplifier has transformers. Now, I know I said it's a solid state amplifier, but it actually has transformers, which also makes it really darn heavy. This thing is heavier than my JTM 45, and it is a pain to get up onto the speaker cabinets. It only has this little handle right here, and it could really use some handles on the side, I would think. Uh, it's a strange design. It's very reliable. Uh, the only thing that I've had go wrong with this is that the reverb has stopped working in the time that I've owned it. Now, I have yet to open the back and go in and see if there are any connections that are dirty or loose, but the amplifier is approaching 30 years old, so I wouldn't be terribly surprised. Now, the cool thing about these amplifiers, well, let me just show you. Yes, it lights up. The whole front of the thing lights up, and it is one of the coolest visual signatures of these old PRS HG70s. Now, the thing is, this amplifier came out at a time, and Eric Pritchard points out that not only did they have difficulty with the amplifier not sounding quite up to the expectations of players, but they also were just introducing it around the time of the Gulf War, uh, there were problems with the economy, and people just weren't interested in this. And then I believe, Eric hasn't mentioned this, but I believe because Mike Matthews started up the Sovtech thing in the early 90s, Tubes were in vogue again, and, well, nobody really wanted a boutique solid-state amplifier. But this does have a lot of really cool features on it. So let's start with the front panel. Now, I am going to play through this with more guitars. I only did it with my Les Paul last time, but I'm going to bring out a C-tuned guitar so that you can really hear what the distortion channel sounds like with max distortion. Uh, but I'm going to go through the front of this really quick before we go to the playthrough. So the controls obviously an on-off switch with no standby because it's a solid-state amplifier. Uh, the channel selector, which you saw when I did the little light-up demonstration that it too lights up, which is pretty darn cool. The reverb, which if it were working would add reverb in, but I mainly use effects from my Line 6, so that's not really a big deal for me. Now the cool thing about this first channel right here is it doesn't say clean channel because it is the rhythm channel. You can actually get a really interesting kind of distortion, which you will hear later on. Uh, it actually has a master volume kind of thing right here. It actually says master. And what you can do is you can drop the gain all the way, crank the master, and then control your gain with this knob. And then you can get your cleans. Or if you really want to get what this channel uh, can do distortion wise, you can just crank the gain and then turn up the master volume. Now it has your normal bass, middle, treble, but it also has a bright, which is 
in my opinion, kind of a resonance knob, uh, which you would find on a lot of amplifiers that have something called resonance. That's what this really, to me, sounds like. Now coming over here to the gain channel, uh, this is your standard master volume distortion channel. And what's really interesting about this is, it, yes, it's solid state. Uh, which normally we like solid state amplifiers for the purpose of getting the same tone at every single volume. But this thing changes as you crank up the volume. Those transformers will saturate. That was all part of Eric Pritchard trying to make this thing sound like a tube amplifier. He did not terribly succeed, but I think this is a really unique, cool amplifier and sounds great for what it is nonetheless. So, you know, same thing here. If you really want to crank what you would consider the preamp gain, you can do that with a control all the way over here. Now, what's interesting is, yes, it has a presence knob and the bass middle treble, but it also has a noise gate. And this is something that really surprised me when I got this amplifier. Uh, I did not know that this gate right here actually does a really good job of cutting out a lot of the noise when you really crank that distortion way up. So a really good idea from Eric Pritchard. So now we're around to the back of the amplifier and you're gonna see some interesting warnings back here and actually a fair number of warnings that are back here. First off, prolonged exposure to high decibel levels can permanently damage your hearing. Wear hearing protection. Thank you so much, PRS, for looking out for my eardrums. I appreciate you immensely. Uh, make sure that you use the correct output impedance. Yes, thank, thank you again. We appreciate it very much. We, we got this. Uh, oh, warning. This panel acts as a heat sink. It may become hot to touch. Keep away from direct lighting. All right, I wasn't planning on shining a spotlight on the back of my amplifier, but cool, well, whatever. It's good to know that that's the thing I shouldn't do. To reduce the risk of fire or electrical shock, do not expose this unit to rain or moisture. Do not open. No user serviceable parts inside. Well, sorry, if you're a user, you cannot service your own PRS HG70 because, dear heavens, why would you ever have to go into the back of your amplifier? And yeah, using your electronic equipment in rain, not generally a really great idea. Thanks again for the tip. Maybe there should be a tip back here about how to brush my teeth, PRS. And there is one more warning on here underneath of the power plug. Warning, to reduce the risk of fire, replace only with same type and rating of fuse. So which is it there, PRS? Can a user service this thing or not? Because you're giving me a service warning here, and then you're telling me that there's nothing inside there I can service. So which is it? What do you want me to do? As for the actual features in the back of this amplifier, you can see that you can set the ohms here for the two speaker outputs. And since I usually run this through two 16 ohm cabs, I have it set for eight ohms. So it goes out to the two 16 ohm cabs. For the purpose of this demonstration, since I'm only gonna be going through one cabinet, I'm gonna set this through to 16 ohms. It has an aux out, which is really, really cool, and a DI out. Uh, this is, I don't know if this is something that is unusual for amplifiers of this time, but that is a really cool feature, that it has an XLR out. If you want to, you can plug this directly into a mixing console. Now, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, Sound-wise, this thing sounds best when you're plugging through some really good speakers, but it's just nice to know that that is, in fact, an option. It has an effects loop, which I love to use with my Line 6 Helix LT. I just plug into the return, and then I can use the volume on the actual pedal itself. And then there is a foot switch jack right here, so you can go back and forth between the distortion and the clean channels. Now, I mentioned earlier there weren't a lot of these things made, and you can see here that this is serial number 122. There were only about 250 of these things, so this comes pretty much right from the middle of the range, and I have never seen one with a super high or super low serial number, so I don't know if this is completely indicative that there are actually 121 of these things before this one got to its production, but well, I'd have to assume that that is indeed the case. Now we're going to take a listen to this thing. Uh, you already did get to hear it a little bit in my last video, but I wanted to give you more of a comprehensive overview of this and kind of show you just how interactive the controls are and really what different styles you can do with this. Uh, right now I'm on the clean channel and you can always tell which channel you're on thanks to the fact that the switch, as you saw when I did the close-up, changes color depending on which channel you're on. Red for the solo and blue for rhythm, in addition to the lights changing here as well. Uh, I have set this so that both channels are approximately the same volume. Uh, you may be able to see here that the master is cranked pretty high. I have it up to about 3 o'clock gains at noon. On the solo channel, I have the master back about 10 o'clock, gains about 
uh, just shy of noon, and everything else is set pretty much straight up and down at noon. And this is your basic clean tone on the bridge pickup on my old Les Paul Classic. Now I hope that that's coming through to you how dark it is in the room. Uh, the mics I'm using are a Sennheiser MD421, and then for the room mic I am using a, a Cascade Fathead ribbon mic. Um, it's really dark. And the funny thing is I'm plugging it through um, greenbacks up on top here, and Vintage 30 in the bottom, and a G12 T75 on the other side in the bottom. Um, so speakers, especially the greenbacks where I have the mic set, that have a tendency to be pretty bright, yet even on the uh, bridge pickup it's pretty dark. So here it is on the neck pickup. Really dark. Of course I also have to remember that these uh, shooting muffs do cut out a lot of those frequencies. Here it is in the middle position. pretty rich full sound, but take a listen to just how interactive these uh, EQ controls are here. So this is the bright, which to me, it's kind of like a resonance because it affects different frequencies from the treble. All the way down. Here it is with it all the way cranked up. already brighter and more bite. All the way down. Oh. Up. So it really affects a lot. Uh, these controls are super interactive. Uh, bass. Super thin even with the neck pickup. All the way up. Oh boy. <laughs> Practically useless. Um, so it usually works best about maybe a little less than noon. Mid control, scooped. All the way up. It's really nasally. So again, uh, uh, about noon is where it works with the best. Uh, treble. All the way off. So really dark again. Oh boy. Adds a lot of brightness in there. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Uh, so I usually like it actually with the treble a little higher. I think it's a really, really good sounding clean channel. And it works well with pedals too. Now what's interesting is you see that there is a gain knob and yes, that's why this is called the rhythm channel, um, not the clean channel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna bring the master all the way back and I'm gonna dial the gain all the way up. So you can hear just how much gain you actually have on this rhythm channel.
So a pretty transistory kind of gain, uh, not particularly warm, but I think we can at least warm it up a little bit. We'll bring the bright and the treble back, uh, bring the mids and the bass up just a little bit, um, keeping on the bridge pickup. better, but uh, the clean channel really isn't where it's at for gain in this amplifier. Um, I think that it works best just with the master pretty high and the gain pretty low. So it just keeps it fairly clean. It takes pedals really well, although usually I go to the input of the effects return for that. Uh, going over to the solo channel, or well, the distortion channel really, uh, there's a lot more volume on tap here. Now that's with everything set to noon, presence, bass, middle, treble, and the gain. Uh, now the gate is interesting, it actually has a noise gate on here, which surprised me when I got it because I didn't know that until it actually came into my possession. So here's with the gain all the way up, the gate is off, now I'm going to start to dial it back until the gain, uh, gate engages and it cuts it off pretty completely. So it's a really effective noise gate. I was very surprised at how useful it actually is. And that's with the gain all the way up and then presence middle, or presence base middle treble uh, set to center. Uh, master volume is set to about uh, 10 o'clock. Now the gain structure is gonna change as you go up in volume because again, this has transformers that can saturate. So right now we've got uh, mostly what you would consider preamp gain if this were a tube amp. Uh, I'm going to keep the controls centered right now, uh, but I'm going to bring the volume up pretty high. So right now, volume is about 10 o'clock. So here it is with the master volume set to about mm, 2 o'clock. I had it set to 3 o'clock, uh, you might have noticed an edit there, well, it started squealing back pretty badly, even with the gate turned pretty high, uh, unpotted pickups and all that fun jazz. So I am going to do a little bit of high volume stuff now, just so you can kind of hear what the tone shifts to when you're at a really high volume on this thing. <laughs> some nice musical feedback out of it too but uh, a lot of times it's just kind of overwhelming the non-potted pickups. Okay so now I've got the master set to about 10 o'clock, the gain is set to about 3 o'clock uh, and I've reduced the gate threshold by quite a bit. Uh, you're gonna hear how beautifully this cleans up. This is with the volume all the way in full on the bridge pickup so it'll be overdriven. <laughs>
So I'm pretty impressed with how that handles um, changes in the volume of the guitar. Uh, now, it doesn't really sound like a tube amp. Um, it reacts pretty well to what you play. Uh, I think it's cool because it gets this clarity at even high volumes. Uh, but let's really get some big fuzz doom kind of stuff out of it. Because to me, what this excels at is really emulating kind of that sun beta lead, uh, strange, odd harmonic kind of distortion where it's uh, it sounds just raucous like the end of the world is happening. Um, so let's put in something that's tuned into C with some hotter pickups. Now we're going to hear some C-tuned madness. I've got my old Greco EG600. Uh, it is tuned in C standard. It has a DiMarzio Super Distortion in the bridge, a DiMarzio Super 2 in the neck. I'm going to be using this for my Caius sound alike video that's going to be coming very shortly, I promise you. I teased it on Instagram and I will make good of my promise. But for now, we're just going to do some big old sun beta lead kind of over the top doomy kind of stuff. So let's go to the distortion channel. Um, same settings, I got the master about 10 o'clock, gain is all the way over at 3 o'clock. <laughs> it retains a lot of clarity. Let's uh, play with the presence a little bit here. All the way up. So it really affects those really high frequencies. A bass. Oh man, that gets gutless. Gosh, that's a little overwhelming. Mids. Totally scooped out. All the way up. So it gets pretty nasty sounding when you increase the treble that much. Uh, plus I'm, again, fairly close to the amplifier here. Um, but let's get ourselves what I would love to do with this amplifier live, which is really use it for some old doomy kind of stuff. <laughs> There you go, that is the PRS HG70 in a nutshell, and it's a weird rare amplifier that never really caught on, the marketplace never really accepted it, they didn't make a whole lot of them, just a couple hundred, 250 or so of them. Uh, Eric Pritchard and PRS have both gone on to bigger and better things, but if you're looking for a weird rare amplifier, a couple hundred bucks entry point, um, you know, it's this or a really heavily discounted beat up crate blue voodoo. You know, uh, it's this or a 110 or 112 speaker cabinet for your uh, 007 bass breaker. Um, personally, I like the weird rare stuff and this has been a very reliable amplifier. I have used it uh, gigging backups uh, mostly for my other amps, but it has never failed me. Uh, even though the reverb has stopped working, it's a 30-year-old amplifier. I'm going to expect some quirks. Uh, but really, you know, I think that the cool thing about amps like this, 
uh, is it's a conversation piece. You know, people come in and they see it lit up and they're like, oh, what's that? I've never seen one of those before. Um, you know, there are a lot of things you can pick up that are expensive that do that, uh, like a Wandre guitar or something. But to me, getting gear that's unusual, that's also inexpensive and reliable, that's a pretty rare Venn diagram where all those things match up. Uh, but this PRS has never failed me. It always works. It always turns on. It always puts out sound. And it's loud. It's raucous. It takes pedals really well. So if you have a couple hundred bucks burning a hole in your pocket and you want to put something else in your studio, watch reverb for these things. Now, yes, the combos will ask a lot more money, uh, especially shipping-wise, because they're so much larger. Um, somebody selling the full stack, you know, with the, uh, the 412 cabinets that these came with, you know, they're going to be asking a premium. But if you find somebody just selling a head, it, 200 bucks. You know, you can walk away with one of these things. Uh, and it's a much more interesting amplifier than getting like an old crate solid state head or something like that. Uh, I like having the weird rare thing and the thing that nobody knows what it is. That's what interests me. So I hope that this has been entertaining and informative. If you really enjoyed this video, I got a lot more. After this video, there are going to be a couple of links to some of my other videos that I've done, including where I first played through this thing. And just like and subscribe, you know, I'll be coming out with more stuff every single Tuesday. Uh, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Just look for Paul the Podcast Guy. Uh, that's my other channel that I do where I do podcasting, but I also put a lot of guitar stuff up on there, a lot of pictures of the gear, and eventually I'll be getting my own Obsessed with Guitars, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc., etc. But for now, just go and find me on those other places, and until next time, stay obsessed with guitars.